live you are live. Good morning and welcome to another perfect African dawn. To the east, the embers of the day are beginning to spark again as a gentle breeze from the southeast fans them after a pretty hot day yesterday. It's about 22 degrees Celsius here at the moment. Well, that's what the weather report says, 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Viam and I reckon probably more accurately sitting one, somewhere around 18 degrees Celsius, which is, I think, 81, if I'm not mistaken. No, it's not. It's absolute nonsense. About 67. And that's because we are low down here on Twin Dams Road in the middle of Juma Private Game Reserve, a little gem in the sea of wonderful wilderness that is the Kruger National Park. And we, to the west of us is Arethusa. We traverse there as well, 1,500 hectares that we are going to be exploring with you live today on our sunrise safari. My name is James Henry. On camera we have Viam. That's Viam's thumb, everyone. He's just finished his coffee. Viam, was it good? No, it wasn't the best. No, Viam, of course, has the taste in coffee that is uh, beyond any kind of understanding. He enjoys chicory with a sort of chocolate mix. It's disgusting. Uh, on the other vehicle today, we have got Jamie, and she is currently being filmed by Brian, all six feet, four inches of him. And in the final control, Louise will be directing, and Kirsten will be abling, ably assisting, we hope, on the keyboard. That means she will be receiving your tweets. Now, what that means is that we must please ask you to talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live if you're tweeting, or questions at wildearth.tv if you're emailing, or talk to us on the YouTube chat thing. I can never really say that in smooth function. I'll try at some stage to get that right. We are on Twin Dams Road here. And just to the south of us is where Karula had a kill the other day. And so we're going to go down there and just have a little bit of a look and see if that young kudu that she had in the tree is still there. Um, just to keep you updated, we know that Karula now does have two cubs. They are only about four to five weeks old. Well, just, we know they're just over five weeks old. We will not be viewing them with the vehicle for now. Probably in the next two or three weeks, we will start to try and view them. If we do bump into them, we are allowed to spend 10 minutes there, and then we will extract from the area. So that's what's going to happen if we see the little baby cups. But I think that they have gone south, down into the reserve next to us, and so they're probably lying in a little cave, having enjoyed a safe evening with their mother, Karula, for the duration of last night. Okay, that's all I have to tell you for now. And thank you, Robbie, for your update. You say there were lions calling at some time during the night. Um, I think about 1.20, you said, to the east. So we'll pop around to the east of the reserve. I know Jamie's going that way now. And we'll see what we can find there. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous morning. And of course, that is a word that one should use today because it is the day that the two gorges, Nikki and Scott, are leaving us today. And, well, it's a new dawn for them and a new dawn for us, I suppose, as well. Kimber, you want to know if we had a good party last night? Well, it was a good send-off, I think, yes. Um, it's always slightly tinged with the fact that you have to be up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And so, I don't think it went on that late. I folded a little bit earlier than most. But that's why I look so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to this morning. But I think it was a good send-off. And I think that we will see them again. I have a feeling in my bones about it. So we're just about around where Karula had her kill, so we'll just keep an eye out in the bushes. Hello, Joe in London, while we're driving along, waiting to get to Karula's little stash, little pantry, little kitchenette. Um, you want to know about, we'll just look on the road here. Yeah, I don't know if you can pick that up. It looks like an enormous snake has been walking along the road, which is uh, not what has happened here at all. That is the trunk dragging of an elephant. An elephant has been walking along here, too lazy to pick up his own nose, and he's left a mark. So it's good just to have a bit of a listen as we 
start out in the morning, see if those lions don't call their last before the sun comes up. Maybe something will alarm call. And I know, Lucy, you said that you heard some alarm calling at about 20 past five at the Juma Dam. Well, we did go past there just after that and didn't hear anything, but we will check up around there. Gorgeous morning. Then, a question about giraffe while we're driving along here. Which is a perfectly valid question, of course. I've just forgotten who it's from. Um, we want to, you want to know... Joan, you're in, you're Joan, London, you're up very, very early. In fact, I suspect you probably didn't get to bed. Um, you want to know if giraffe have vocal cords? You've read that they don't. Joe, um, as far as I'm aware, they do have vocal cords. There's probably a variation of a vocal cord. There are lots of hyena tracks on the road here. Um, but as far as I'm aware, all mammals have them, if I'm not mistaken, or some kind of variation of them. And they can communicate. They communicate with something we call infrasound, which is a sonic um, range that is too low for us to hear. The frequency is too low. The wavelengths are too long for our ears to hear. <laughs> I just saw this finger emerge from behind the camera, and then I spotted a bird. I think it's a Wahlberg needle or an owl. I think it's a little Wallbees. Looks like it might call. Let me just go a little bit further along and see if we can't get a better look. Well spotted, Vim. I see that chicory chocolate mix has uh, sharpened your mind and your eyes. I had my sleep last night. Ah, yes. Oh, is that thing? I'm just going to keep going. There's another little gap here that we might be able to see it through. It has hidden itself very cleverly, hasn't it? Sorry, man. Ah, there we go. Now, everyone. Now, just from the just from the shape of that bird and his so slightly large head, I would have said that that was a brown snake eagle flying into the dawn sky. All right, let's head across to Jamie. See what she's got to tell us for the morning. I think she's heading north. We're going to continue on south. We'll keep you updated. And a very good morning to all of you across the world. And what a glorious start to the morning it is. There's nothing like facing the sunset, driving down a long straight road into the bush and wondering what prospects the morning holds. Definitely put me in a far better mood than I originally started my day with. Some elephants wandered into our garden and pushed over a tree known as a zebra wood. Some of our regular viewers might be familiar with them. I'll look for one to show the rest of you. Zebra woods essentially is a, a tree that has incredibly long spines and is very, very solid. Anyway, they pushed it over at about head height this morning, and since I was driving out in the dark, I definitely encountered more than a slap to the head than I intended to start my day with. But with a view like that, one definitely cannot stay miserable forever. Well done, Wendy. But good morning to you all, my name is Jamie and I have Brian on camera with me this morning. We're going to head out and see if we can follow up on the calls of the lions that the guys heard last night when they went on a little bit of a game drive bumble for Scott and Nikki's farewell party. And Ravi, I think you also sent through an update that you heard lions roaring on the Juba Dam camera. I think it's time for us to go and search for them. So whilst James makes his way towards Karula's Kill to find out what's happening there, I've come up to the northern boundary. I'm then going to cut across down along Cheetah Cut Line, so to the east of the property. And figure out if we can't work out who came through. I've been listening very, very carefully this morning. No sign of anything coming through. 
sorry, I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. Just giving Aubrey and James is just giving Aubrey an update on our morning's plans so that the guides can spread out and divide their attention evenly to the different parts of the reserve rather than all of us checking the same place repeatedly. Just make sense to divide and conquer. particular elephant encounter this morning was less with the elephant and more with the havoc that it had wreaked upon our driveway. <coughs> Tom, who is watching in Dallas, was wondering if we've ever seen an elephant step on its trunk or heard of it happening. And Tom, once they're a sort of maturity age, I've never ever seen it happen. I've seen them do some very odd things with their trunks in terms of wrapping them around each other. But it's incredible their level of coordination. I mean, we as people stub our toes and knock our knees and our hips all the time and trip over, maybe it's just me, but trip over our own feet on a regular basis. I've never seen an elephant do that. I've never ever seen it step on its trunk. The interesting thing about baby elephants, when they're very young, they, their trunks are proportionately smaller, so proportionately shorter than those of the adults because there is a chance that they could do something like that. If you've ever watched a baby elephant and the way that they use their trunks, it takes a couple of years before they are as coordinated as the older elephants. Now initially they've got, it's almost like toddlers learning their coordination with their hands. They seem to have that reflex of curl and grasp that all trunks display, but they haven't quite mastered how to use it. And it can be absolutely hilarious to watch a baby elephant trying to learn how to use its trunk and imitating its mom. There's something so something that we can so easily relate to as humans. I'm just going to go through this dip quickly. Here we go. Seems to be fine. So yes, the trunks, I've never seen an elephant or heard of an elephant stepping on stepping on its own trunk but babies it's not impossible that's why their trunks are slightly shorter than an adult's might be and while i continue on along the northern boundary let us find out what mr henry is up to and if he's got any updates for you we are at twin dams everybody and the kudu that was a tree that uh, karula killed for herself in order to keep her spirits and nutrition up while she suckles those two babies has gone. I suspect that this is perfectly normal. What happens is they'll eat for a while and eventually it becomes, they've eaten so much that it becomes difficult to keep the, whatever it is in the tree. And I know there was a hyena lurking under the tree yesterday and I suspect the hyena made off with the remains of the carcass. And Karula has pressed on to go and see where her little ones are. And that's what's happened. So no Karula at the moment. Probably not for the rest of the day. So we'll head east and see if we can't hear those lions calling again. Hello Roy. Very interesting question. Why are we only allowed to see the cubs for 10 minutes if we see them? Roy, we don't want to put pressure on her at the moment. So it's obviously a difficult time for her. There's a very sensitive stage of development. They cannot climb trees in an effective way and therefore they cannot get away from potential predators at the moment. What we don't want to do is to get into a position where we are driving around, say we find her, for example, walking down the road here. Um, the vehicle is obviously quite a noisy thing. It's got very odd smells and those, sort, and those sorts of things. We don't want them to be distracted by the vehicle and say a hyena comes along or a lion comes along. They must be fully aware that of what's going on around them so that they can climb a tree and get away from any predator that might attack them. That's why if we do see them, it would be a stop the car, have a view. I mean, if they just walked around here and were playing over here, we will probably maybe stay 15 minutes. But certainly we wouldn't want to be making a noise or making a smell around them when they need to have all their wits about them to try and defend themselves from predators. 
I mean, I think if, if you were on your own reserve, if you were the only vehicle in the area and you had complete control over how the sightings were run and how it was all done, then I think you would probably get away with uh, viewing them a little earlier. So if we were, say, a, a, a lone film crew on a reserve, I think it would be possible because you'd be only be one vehicle going in there. But there are hundreds of cars around here and driving around with lots of people. Everybody wants to see a leopard. Everybody wants to, everybody wants to see leopard cubs. And it's just much easier to say, let's leave it until she's able to take them up a tree, until they're able to independently assess whether they're in danger or whether they aren't. And that's why if we see them now, we'll probably just give them some space. And a very good question to which there's a very simple answer. I think you will probably, um, you may do one of these, you may go, ah, ah, yes, of course. You want to know why it is that herbivores don't den their young? Because yes, of course, as you say, are they not at a greater risk, given that uh, things like to eat them? Leanne, remember, let's take an impala as an example. An impala's got a gestation period of six and a half months to seven months. A leopard has a gestation period of just over three months. Now, there's a similar weight, a similar mass. Impala slightly heavier, but they're a similar mass. And that means, of course, that the fetus of a herbivore is enormously developed in comparison with that of a predator. Now, there are various reasons for that, but the simple reason for why the herbivores don't need a den is that the babies can run from the day that they are born. Remember, they can get up within, we had an amazing, amazing sighting the other day of a zebra being born, and that little foal was up within 20 minutes. Now, a leopard cub is born totally what we call altricial, blind, um, can't hear anything, and it's a little ball of fluff about that big. Tiny, tiny. And it takes a long time for it to be able to actually move around. Oh, there are very good reasons for that. Interesting little bird amassing enough fat so that it might go home. And home, of course, is Europe. That is the red-backed shrike. And he looks like he's got a little bandit's mask around his eyes. That's how you identify him from the front. His gray head, his white breast, and then on his back, he's not quite red, but it's a sort of um, deep reddish brown. I knew this was going to come. Louise says he looks like Zorro. Yes, I suppose he does. If one must, um, if one must compare him with a, a human being, then I suppose Zorro must be it. I thought the Lone Ranger myself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. More the Lone Ranger than Zorro, don't you think? Mm, which Lone Ranger? What do you mean, which Lone Ranger? There are hundreds of films about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get into a lengthy debate about which Lone Ranger it was. <laughs> Hello, Lyle, in Washington. Good question. When does she stop carrying them around by the nape of the neck? So I'm sure many of you have seen footage or pictures of cats being carried by their mothers, and they get picked up exactly like you might pick up a house cat by the scruff of the neck, a loose bit of skin there, and that's how they move them from den to den when they're very little. I think, Lyle, you'll find that um, from, hmm, as soon as they can really move, so they're, they're probably, she could carry them now, they could walk now, and I know they were walking around here yesterday, and they're five weeks old, so I'd say probably up to about four weeks, Lyle. Find out what's going on here. I will not go here. Okay. Hey, Gala, I want to come. I'm sure. Okay. She was asking about the leopard. I said she wasn't around. Um, but they've obviously got more access down there. I'm not sure what plan is on Chitra Chitra. Jeff? 
sorry, I'm just checking for some tracks here. Uh, you want to know what I would be doing if, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now? Jeff, I'd probably be um, homeless on the street. Trying to grow my own vegetables in a patch of pavement. What do you think, Liam? Maybe struggling author. Struggling author. Yes, I'm already a struggling author. Um, I don't know, Jeff. I, I mean, I was teaching the guitar for some time before I came here. And I was working on a community conservation project just north of Palabawa. Um, so I guess I've probably been doing one or two of those things. I might also be trying to, uh, you know, become a rock star. Although by the time you've hit my advanced years, um, it's normally happened if it's going to happen. Stop nodding, Liam. Liam was nodding vehemently there, saying, yeah, yeah, no, a waste of time there. You better find something else to do. There's always idols. There's always idols, but I think you have to be under 30 to get on idols. And James Taylor, you want to know if a leopard will carry its babies up a tree by the, in the mouth? No, they won't. Um, I suppose they would if they had to or if they were suddenly in the situation where they were found themselves under attack and she was moving them, she might climb a tree with a leopard in her mouth. But no, they won't sort of stash them in a tree by the mouth. Normally the little cubs will learn to climb trees on their own completely, which is rather nice. I can't wait until we actually are able to spend a bit of time with her. I suspect that her time is going to be spent half kind of on the, in the south there on Chitra Chitra and half on Juma. She really, she seems to have split her ways. And as Brent was saying last night, we probably actually had them on Juma because the fact that they were around that kill the other day indicates that they were probably not too far from that all the time. And I wonder if she didn't have a den, probably somewhere on Deadwood Road uh, in the drainage lines there. Maybe we just didn't pick it up and that's okay. It's absolutely fine. We're going to look at some water buck here, and then we're going to stop and listen for the lion as a calling. Brian Jurgensen, you want to know how long it is before a leopard is able to eat solid food? I think that water buck is heavily pregnant. Um, Brian, they'll start to eat meat from probably as early as six weeks. And they'll be completely weaned by three months. Hmm. I think that female we looked at at the beginning is, is very pregnant. And the waterbuck and the kudu seem to be dropping their lambs and calves. Well, they're both calves at this stage. hear the bearded woodpecker going tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick in the background and another waterbuck cow steaming across the road. Hmm. Daintily. So just hold on everybody. Uh, negative orbs, the kudu is gone, so I think yeah, there's nothing there now. Right, marvellous. Louise says it looks like they're wearing uh, scarves with all that fluff on their necks. I suppose it does look a little bit like that, but the interesting thing is, despite the fact that they do look like they've got very sort of thick hair, um, that hair is very sparse because with thick hair, and if it was closely packed together like the fur of most animals, it's so hot out here that it would be almost impossible for them to survive. And so that hair, despite the fact that it makes them look like shaggy teddy bears, if you kind of get close to it, is actually very sparsely spaced. Right, we're now on the eastern boundary, still waiting for the sun to peep up over the horizon. I think it's going to come up very soon. I'm just going to 
going to keep checking out for tracks on the road. I don't know, you know, those lions, if they were calling it, well, what, 11 o'clock and then 1 o'clock again, they could have gone miles and miles from here. All right, while we do that, let's head across to Jamie, find out what she's doing, get an update there, and I'll catch up with you later. I'm just a little bit of a change of plans since Wendy's being a little bit recalcitrant this morning. It doesn't seem to want to go all the way to the east without us losing picture. But uh, we've decided instead we'll go to a quarantine and see what we can find around there. Now, the reason I stopped here initially was because the guinea fowl were shouting furiously. And that's always a good idea to stop for guinea fowl. They've led me to a couple of leopards in my time in the bush, but they, I think, are alarm calling at that Warburg's. Oh, here comes a Heidi da. Ah! My favorite story is that Heidi does. <laughs> Heidi does do that and scream like that because they're actually scared of heights and quite frightened of flying. <laughs> well done, Brian. That was epic. But you can sort of imagine it. Heidi does flapping furiously going, ah. A Warburg's eagle, the pale morph Warburg's. We see them fairly regularly. And the cause of the guinea fowl's alarm, although they appear to have now forgotten that it is there in their sort of short term memory way that they have such a talent for. Apparently, while we look at this beautiful eagle, apparently there was a question about what we would do if we weren't doing this. Apparently, James said that he would be homeless. It's a very good question. I think if I had to try and decide, I think that I would probably be working as a wildlife vet. I say that very hopefully. It's a very difficult industry to break into. In South Africa, there's only really one university that offers a suitable vets course. And it, the exception, uh, acceptance standards are very, very high. But I think that is what I would like to be doing if I was not doing this. However, it's a difficult decision. I don't, I can't really at this point picture myself doing anything else. What would you be doing, Brian? I'd also be homeless. You'd also be homeless. Yeah. Okay, so we've got two for the homeless score. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what um, Wildebeest would be doing. Something, it's somehow for me, <laughs> VM would be doing something absolutely, totally different and wonderfully fascinating. Might be a secret agent. In fact, I'm not even sure he isn't a secret agent, come to think of it. Hmm, never thought of that before. Everything makes so much more sense now. Oh. Oof. It's okay, Wendy. Now, of course, we are all hugely relieved and thrilled to hear that Karula's cubs have survived their first crucial few weeks. But James Richards was wondering, just having had a look at that Wahlberg's eagle, he was wondering whether a bird of prey, for example, like a martial eagle, would be a threat to leopard cubs. And absolutely they would be. One of the many things, it's one of the reasons why leopards pick nice, covered, sort of sheltered den sites, and why leopard cubs have such a strong instinct to stay hidden and undercover. Now, James, initially when I first got my dog, who She's now absolutely hefty, a fair-sized Vibarana, but at the time I got her, she was about that big. About seven weeks old when I took her to the bush for the first time, and completely unaware, you know, without the wild animal instincts to look up all the time. And I spent the first few months of her life absolutely terrified, paranoid, that she was going to get taken off by a martial eagle or something similar. It does happen. It happens fairly regularly. For some reason, it happens fairly regularly in Natal. Crowned and booted eagles seem to enjoy doing, making off with people's pet dogs. Can you follow upset here now? They're very cross. Mm. Let's just sit and listen for a moment. It 
cackling sound that you can hear is the guinea fowl, very angry guinea fowl. I wonder if after all of that, there isn't a leopard wandering through that drainage line. There's three main things that guinea fowl alarm call at, apart from people. One is a leopard and a li or a lion. The other is a bird of prey. And then the third is a snake. And it depends on where the guinea fowl are, what particular threat it is. So very often when there is a leopard moving through, they very often take to the tops of trees. Well, I don't see any of them in the top of a tree now. Just keep your eyes peeled for any kind of flash of movement. And I think let's, let's just go and poke our noses into this drainage line. Well, we go and investigate and see what those guinea fowl are alarm calling at. Oren wanted to know, can a predator distinguish between the smell of a leopard cub versus an adult leopard? Yes, I'm, I'm almost certain they can. Since the sense of smell that animals have is so intense. What's the matter, guinea fowl? Let me see if I can see them from here. They're still very cross. A snake. Everybody just keep your eyes peeled. The interesting thing is that it's only guinea fowl at the moment that are alarm calling. So whatever the threat is, the squirrels in the area and the go away birds in the area haven't spotted it. Hmm. One moment, I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna hop out of the car. You can stay with us. I'm gonna hop out of the car and just stick my nose through here since I can't see through the bushes. Let's see if we can't figure out what's upset these guinea fowl in the way it has. There's no need to be concerned. I'm not doing anything dangerous. What's got you so upset? see anything. Now at this point I'm thinking that it's some it might have been a bird of prey that's moving through there or even a genet is also a possibility and the reason I say that is they've tucked themselves into a very thick bush now at this point, just walking into that direction at that distance, if there was a leopard there, or a lion or anything like that, it would have actually have moved. It would have been alert to my presence, but it wouldn't have run away. The leopards in particular of the Sabi Sands are very, very comfortable with people on foot. Many of you have experienced that. Brian, you filmed Karula once on foot. An awesome, awesome sighting. Alright, well I'm going to loop around, try and see if I can see further into the drainage line. While I do that, let's find out what Mr. Hendry's been up to. Well, we're driving down the cheetah cut line, still far east of Juma, seeing if perhaps the lions haven't crossed on. We have seen no evidence of them at all, but we have seen evidence of a little sort of tongues of cloud blowing in here from the east. Now, that is an unusual direction for the clouds to be coming from, and I'm just going to get into a high point where you can see them, and maybe, maybe there is some form of precipitation blowing in a storm from the east over the Mozambique Channel. 
Um, maybe Luisi can tell us whether there is anything predicted on the weather. Hello, Sunita. Very nice to hear from you. You're getting hold of us all the way from India. Oh, very nice. Um, and thank you for joining us, and thank you for taking the time to ask a question. You want to know about cheetah. Do we see cheetah here? Is it possible to see them? Sunita, we're actually on something called the cheetah cut line, uh, which is this road. But we don't see cheetah often. Now, if I ask Vim to pan over the landscape here, you can see that it is quite thick. It is full of bush. There is not the kind of easy, open space that a cheetah needs to had to run at those are tremendous speeds and then a cheetah will um, either bash its head or and i'm not joking here bash its head or kind of injure its belly trying to run through here at, a, at a, you know 100 kilometers an hour so we do see them from time to time but they are not common here at all Sunita. they'd be much more common in the south of the sabi sands where there are much more open areas and then of course up into east africa we know that there are lots of them very nice question, thank you, and please feel free to send further questions, Sunita, all the way from India. I'd love to know where in India you're from. It is a vast and magnificent country. Ah, apparently rain is predicted from Wednesday until the end of the week. Well, I seriously doubt that this is the, uh, the rain front coming in now. This is probably just a, a little, I don't know, teaser, perhaps. Of course, what normally happens with these rain predictions is that you, you see them and it says it's going to rain on Wednesday, and then by Monday it says it's going to rain on Thursday, and then by Tuesday uh, the rain has gone completely and you're staring down the barrel of 40 degrees of blinding white sunlight again. That seems to be the case for this summer. We're nearly at the very northern tip now of Cheetah Cut Line. Ah, here we go. And what does normally happen is that it heats up towards the time when we're going to have rain. Tuesday, we're looking at 39 degrees Celsius. That, everybody, is about 102 degrees Fahrenheit, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is the beginning of autumn, of course, at 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I didn't get that too easy. We're going to have to go again. Cell phones making noise. Uh, it's not mine. Yeah. Mine's a flight now. Not from here, I'm afraid, Luisi. So that just as the sun popped up, this kind of bank of cloud has covered it over. And we shan't be particularly sad about that. Because today, of course, is also voter registration day, which means that we have to go out into the community, some of us, and register to vote so that we might put our important marks on the voting roll come the municipal elections of this year. That is not particularly impressive or interesting given the uh, presidential race going on in the United States. When you get to the point of discussing the voters' roles in the uh, presidential race in the United States, it means that there is no animal to look at. Now, Clown Sharon, you have said something about coffee, which I'm afraid my communications are not particularly strong this morning. Um, you say I'm a connoisseur of coffee. I am indeed a connoisseur of coffee, Clown Sharon. And a very nice dark roast would be a pleasant addition to the morning. We did, I have already had one nice cup of coffee this morning, uh, made by Kirsten McLennan-Smith. She's the one who gets up early and puts the coffee machine on, while the rest of us roll about trying to find some kind of, um, well, to find, to find our brains, really, at four o'clock in the morning. Okay, we've turned now to the west, onto the northern Biffleswood cut line. There have been no signs of lions coming across this way, and so we're going to go and check the dam. Otherwise, I fear me, there are no lions on Juma today. Uh, there might be some on Arethusa, and of course, if you were a guest driving around here, you could quite easily see lions because you would be driving on to Bilfosuk and Torchwood, which is well, not where we can drive because our signal doesn't extend that far and we don't have traversing. Anyway, 
That's not to say we shouldn't see a leopard or other magnificent wildlife. Maybe an elephant, that would be nice. Maybe something. A bird, a bird would be nice. Instead of the wilting leaves and the drought-stricken trees. Can you see how that rhymed there, Vian? Oh, I was listening. Uh, let me say it again for you. Wilting leaves on the drought-stricken trees. Leaves, trees. That's it. Uh, I'll give it Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Let's turn in towards the Beefles Hoof Dam. Jamie, at least, is following up on some alarm calls. So with any luck, she'll turn something interesting up. What we're going to do is have one very last listen over here and see if we can't hear anything in the way of alarm calls to or perhaps a predator calling its last before the day takes hold. I can hear some zebra going. And they seem to be fighting a bit at the moment and I wonder if the stallions aren't thinking about breeding again. If this would be the kind of peak mating time. And I heard a really sort of strident whining from a zebra yesterday, and I thought, oh, I think we've got something being killed here, and we found them. And there was actually two stallions having a fight with each other, and as one of them got hold of the other, because they bite, they've got really powerful jaws, and they bite each other horribly, uh, one of them was whining. A large male zebra whining. Very unmanly. like the sound that Andrew Bryan and I made when we were trying to catch the rat. Is that a tree, then? A road? Yes. You don't think it's a giant lion? I wish it is a giant lion. Oh, it's a stump. Okay. Right, well, okay. Are you gonna, um, are you copying a thing? No. To Louise. Oh. Louise. Should we link to Louise? Yeah, sure. Okay, we're going to link across to Louise for some reason. Um, I think he means Jamie. Why am I not copying? I wouldn't say it was a weird reason. I think it's a pretty good reason. Yes, we have found, I'm fairly certain, at least one of the culprits for my morning head injury. Hey boy, did you come into our driveway and trash the garden? Yep. Look at that face, definitely, definitely guilty. There we go, you can sort of get an idea since we were talking this morning about elephants stepping on their trunks. They've got the most incredible proprioception. In other words, their spatial awareness is second only really to that of dolphins and whales and humans and the great apes of course they've got these incredibly large brains and most of it is devoted to emotional development and their proprioception so even though they've got that blind spot below their head they can't see anything they still have that awareness and level of coordination you can see it would be, it would be possible physically possible for him to step on his trunk especially with the accordion like stretching ability that those hundred thousand muscles in the trunk provide hey little boy what's up that long-legged walk even though he looks like he's moving slowly a stride like that with two meters between each step or six feet between each step or quick dust bath covers an enormous amount of ground. Oh, here's another one of the culprits. I didn't even see that one. Let's go forward a little bit. He's going to give himself a nice dust bath oh. in the morning light. While I reposition, James has found a tiny little antelope for you. Let's have a quick look. This steel look here seems to have Great and highly unattractive infestation of ticks on its face. Those ticks or flies, yeah? Ticks. No, they move like flies, but there is some stationary. I think there are flies. I can see them moving around. 
They're obviously not irritating her because I don't think she could survive it. Well, she couldn't be able to kind of uh, sit comfortably if those were ticks. Can you check your mic for me? Check my mic. Can you hear me now, Viam? Um, Molly, you're in Ohio and you want to know, uh, you, you've read that uh, Dyker bury their dung and Steenbock don't, and why is that? Uh, it's actually the other way around, Molly. Um, Steenbock will bury their dung within their territories. Why don't Dyker do it? Well, I think the question is why do Steenbock, and they do it, of course, because what it does is it, it, it hides their scent, so they will leave it out on the ground, on the sort of outskirts perimeter of their territories, and then inside the territory they'll bury their dung. I don't know why a dyker doesn't do it. I don't think a dyker is actually as territorial as a steenbok, and I suspect oh, they've just got a clever adaptation that the dyker don't. I think it's a very good question. Dyker is about, mm, well, not twice the size. It's about one and a half times the size of that steenbok. All right, let's get it back across to Jamie. She's got some elephants for you. wonderful view of these young bulls in the morning light and when they're at about this age which I would guess at probably around about 20 or so they tend to be a little bit more skittish and a little bit more nervous than the adult bulls tend to be hello boy they usually require a little bit more in the way of personal space the older bulls will very often come forward to investigate and say hello the younger males aren't quite so secure in their, in their size and their strength just yet. That's because they've had the safety and security net of a herd for most of their lives. It's actually quite a considerably traumatic event for a young male elephant, even though their instincts tell them it's time to go off on their own. Having a little bit of company also helps tremendously. Which is why you very often see them in these little bachelor groups. I think I'm going to try roll forward just one more little bit. Try and get the branch out of the way. Yeah, I think that's as good as it's going to get. Nope, still very much in the way. <laughs> Munching away at a buffalo thorn like it means nothing to them. And we just sit and listen there's a woodpecker tapping away sounds to me and it is a guess but it's a fairly educated guess it sounds to me like a bearded woodpecker that we've been hearing hello boy you come say hello when you're judging the size of an elephant and trying to guess at its age it's important to remember that just like people they have genetic differences in their appearance. So looking at the size of the tusks is not an automatic indication of age. There you go, you can hear that woodpecker again. Some elephants just are genetically programmed to have larger tusks than others. For this boy, I think he's actually going to have fairly long, fairly thin tusks when he reaches maturity. Quite often when you, what you'll find with these young bachelor groups is that there'll be a couple of younger bulls that will congregate around an older male, a male sort of 30, year old, 30 years old or older. Oh, excuse you, Mr. Elephant. I'm fairly certain that the third male is in, who is in here somewhere is one of the older ones. It might even be that elephant with the big hole in his ear. It's an interesting, I saw the video of Scott with that elephant and it seems it's definitely the same elephant that Tara had an encounter with Tara being for new viewers Tara being one of the previous presenters who had a very very close encounter with an elephant coming up to have a sniff definitely the same elephant Young males saying in answer to Lucy's question, Lucy's watching in South Bend, Indiana. 
These young bulls can travel on their own, and the larger males very often do, but they seem to enjoy the company of other males. It's basically a bachelor herd. There's our third elephant. Oh, he's also young, hiding in the back there. Isn't it amazing how a six-ton animal can disappear in the space of about 30 meters or 90 feet, vanishing behind the trees? So Lucy, when they are males, they can live solitary and move about in a solitary manner, but they do very often come together with other males and form little bachelor herds, particularly when they are younger and when they've just left the herd. And then of course the females stay within a group for their entire lives. They will always be with their family and every elephant within a herd is related in some way, whether it's a sister, an aunt, a cousin, a little female calf born into a herd will be with that family for the rest of her life. <coughs> come, boy. You're going to come out. This light is stunning. A sighting like this is absolutely filled with peace. And I don't think there is any other animal that can quite impart the sense of wisdom and comfort that elephants can. And I'm not alone in thinking that. I know that most people feel that way. James Richards was just saying, it's amazing how animals, like, or the elephants, can raise your heartbeat and yet at the same time calm your soul. And I think that is a perfect description. It doesn't matter what sort of mood I'm in, at any point in time, sitting with elephants always transmits a sense of absolute peace. There's one other animal that actually has that effect, and I think it's going to wander onto, oh no, it was a giraffe that was thinking about wandering towards us, but she's moved off now. I said about aging elephants and the fact that these are fairly young bulls. Brian Jokinson, who is one of our regular viewers, has been listening intently to our information and has said, isn't it a good way, or isn't it a good way to age elephants by looking at the indentations in their skulls around their temporal region? And yes, absolutely, as elephants start to get older, particularly when they get past the sort of 40 year old mark, their skin starts to lose elasticity, they lose that subcutaneous level of fat, and as a result, it starts to sag. The, the face starts to sag in the temporal region, and their cheekbones and their skulls become more and more prominent. And that's a very, very good way of looking at an elephant. And then, of course, looking at the size of the head as well is probably a far better indication than looking at the tusk size themselves. These young gentlemen, all of the learning that they have done in the last 20 or so years has been absolutely crucial. And James Blair was wondering, when they do leave the herd, who teaches them or what teaches them to be adult male elephants? Is it the lessons that their mothers have taught them? Is it older males? Or is it instinct? And the answer is it's a very, very much a combination of the three of those things. So whilst mothers might not actively teach them whilst in the herd, they definitely learn by observation. So watching the behavior of other males moving about in that particular group. Then once they leave, it's a matter of instinct and learning by experience. And as I said, they very often join up with older males for a time, not, always, not permanently, but they'll come and go with older males, spend a bit of time with them. And there again, learning by observation is one of the things that elephants are particularly good at. Just watch, for example, with a young baby, watching the others learn, watching the others use their trunks, as we discussed earlier. 
and then attempting to imitate the same movements. Elephants are intelligent enough to learn lessons by experience. Tail swishing away. That's a, very much a sign of a happy elephant. You can judge so much about their mood from the way that the tail moves. So that swinging from side to side comfortably, ears flapping gently, is a sign of a very peaceful Eddie. Hey, boy. You happy? You happy having destroyed Inga's garden? Yes. There's a couple of giraffe that are now moving slowly across towards the elephant and keeping a very, very close eye on them. They're hidden very much behind the trees. There you go. Some spots for you. Now, when we look at giraffes and elephants, we refer to them as their babies as calves. But kathy has got a question along those lines, which is basically with antelope species, and we'll include giraffe in a bovid sense, so they're still quite closely related to antelope species. Hello. Hello, Gully. Sorry, Kathy. I'll, I'll get back to your question. Let's just enjoy them in silhouette. Coming past. It's the same journey of giraffe that I saw yesterday. There's about seven in this group at the moment. Now, here's an animal that is the antithesis of the elephant's social structure. No set pattern, no set herd pattern. They like each other's company, but there's no group that stays constant for any amount of time. They'll quite happily move off on their own. Essentially the complete opposite in terms of social structure which is interesting because we're looking at two of the biggest mammals that we have out here, at least in terms of height. There's only one thing that can feed higher or reach higher up than a giraffe can, and that is an elephant reaching, a, ma a large male elephant reaching up high. I'm gonna try and see, it's gonna make a noise. I wanted to try and get both the giraffe and the elephants in shot. I think we might. Let's see if we can. Yeah. Luckily, we've got a really subtle start to the vehicle. moving nice and slowly. There we go. Thanks, boy. Sorry, my boy. We won't come any closer. It's okay. You can eat your breakfast. Giving me that out of the corner of his eye look. Elephants have... They're the only animal I know that do that. They look at you quite literally like a human does when they're looking at you out of the corner of their eye, pretending not quite to look at you. There we go. A journey of giraffe. Mostly females and their youngsters. I thought I saw a male around at the back. And there's at least five there that I can count, and two more have moved across behind them. So seven giraffe in total. And I call them a journey. It also can be known as a skyscraper of giraffe, which is a bit ridiculous. That might be stretching things a little bit. I once asked a group of school kids what they thought a collective noun for giraffe would be, and my favorite answer was a jumble, a jumble of giraffe. And still to this day, whenever I think of a collective noun for a giraffe, I think a jumble. 
It was adorable. They were very young, very young kids. There was another one that they came up with. It was to do with zebra. It was a, what was it? Oh, I'll have to think and try and remember. I'll get back to you on that one. It was also an adorable answer, but my brain's refusing to remember exactly what it was. Now, Kathy, just to go back to your question about, um, you wanted to know, in terms of the naming, since we're talking about collective nouns and correct terminology, you wanted to know a little bit about the naming of antelope babies. We'll ex extend that to all of the youngsters in this particular area. So you're wondering in particular whether all antelope babies are called lambs or if some have calves. And the answer is yes, they have lambs and they have calves and the division happens with the Inyala. So anything smaller than a female Inyala, for example an Impala or a Steenbok, is referred to as a ram or a ewe and their babies are referred to as lambs. So Impala lambs that are born around the sort of month of November, December. Once you get to a kudu bull, so a male kudu or larger, that is where he's resting, just like a person. You know when you shift your weight into one hip? That's exactly what he's doing there. <laughs> taking, taking the weight off his leg. <laughs> like Brent's gonna have to do for the next few weeks. <laughs> so anything larger than an Inyala bull, uh, for example, a kudu is referred to as a cow, a bull, or a calf. In the case of elephants, they have calves. Giraffe also have calves. Buffalo have calves. You've got the leopard and lion cubs, wild dog pups, hyena cubs, because they're more closely related to cats than they are to dogs. And then you start getting to the confusing ones like baby mongoose and baby honey badger. I was desperately trying to think last night what a baby honey badger is called. Pretty sure it's a cub. But now that I say that in the, in the light of day, in the light of day, it seems a bit odd. It made a lot of, it made a lot more sense last night when I was thinking about it. Hmm, well I'll put that question to you. What is a baby honey badger called? Because I should know, but I'm struggling this morning. I couldn't begin to tell you what it is. to go back to my comment about the leaning elephant and Brent's grievous injury. Kimber apparently asked earlier um, or commented that it, maybe Brent's injured hamstring was the reason he's not on drive. Uh, he's not on drive because he's actually still on leave at the moment. However, he has grievously wounded himself in the cricket match, slightly overextended the same, the same hamstring that popped out of place during the great race of 2016 across quarantine with Mr. Hendry. And I won't go into any further detail, I'll leave that particular conversation to James. Oh, that's beautiful. Hello, boy. Ah. Uh, I should have got that. Apparently baby honey badgers are called kits. So like a baby ferret is called a kit and I suppose the Mastilidae very closely related. A bad boy. <laughs> Our journey of giraffe wandering through. Watch keeping a very close eye on the elephant. And as our giraffe move across and hopefully out into the open area of quarantine where we can have a nice close look at them, but how awesome is this with elephant and giraffe, two iconic animals of Africa. And as our giraffe slowly moves through towards the clearing, Eric has said that he's noticed that giraffe have hair on their lips and was wondering why. Morning Eric, it's as always fantastic to have you on the show. Eric, it's, they sort of function in a very similar way to whiskers. So especially when giraffe lean in close to thorny trees and they have to close their eyes, it gives them that extra level of proprioception. So essentially feeling with their lips before they nibble around the leaves and thorns that they get. So it's very, very, very tactile part of their bodies. 
If you look at them, that whole structure of the way their lips are structured, the dexterity that they have, and the way that they're able to negotiate thorns if they choose to, otherwise they just pop them straight into their mouths, but nibbling away at the shoots and the bases of leaves. And then the position of their nostrils, and I swear the more you look at giraffe nostrils, the weirder they start to look. They've got this sort of flat positioning, and as soon as they lean into a thorny or a spiky tree, immediately those nostrils shut. So everything about a giraffe's face is that long, narrow nose for reaching into trees. Everything's adapted for the way that they feed. Those long, long eyelashes, which elephants have as well, also very useful for making sure the eye isn't injured in the process of feeding. I'm going to go scoot forward a little bit. Our elephants are still here, although our giraffe have slowly moved off. While I loop this elephant, Mr. Henry has found a pig to show you. We found a pig, everybody. Yes, I know it's at about 700 paces, but at least it's a pig. It's a heartbeat. It's something to look at. And he's, uh, he's very confused, you see, because he's down through a drainage line and he doesn't know or not if we can see him. Look how far away he is. <laughs> That's so cool. Liam, I don't feel that you're nearly impressed enough that I managed to spot that pig. Well, it's because you want me to spot a leopard, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Fair enough. We did have some male leopard tracks. We went towards Bivol's or Dam. We had some male leopard tracks. I'm pretty sure, though, that they are old. We had male leopard tracks around there. They looked like there was quite a lot walking on top of them. So we didn't spend a great deal of time trying to follow up. I've been very interested in how the condition of the warthogs has been maintained. Hello, Kimber. <laughs> you say that Brent hurt his hamstring and you wonder if that is why he is not on drive. Uh, no, that's not why he's not on drive. He's not on drive because he's on leave. He just came back to say goodbye to Scott, um, but otherwise he would be on drive. His hamstring, while um, certainly looked to be quite nastily hurt when we first saw him yesterday, after the party got going last night, uh, his dancing would indicate very little ill effects, to be honest. I suspect this morning, his hamstring is going to be very, very sore when he eventually wakes up. <laughs> but he's on leave for another four days. Hello, Sunita. You're in, as I asked you, I said, where in India are you from? You say you're from Bangalore. It's very nice to know that. Thank you very much for that. And there's just a starling up there, if you wouldn't mind, Liam. I don't like, I know starling's not your favorite. And you say you would very much like to see a cheetah. Well, Sunita, so would we, and certainly we'll do our best to try and find one. Now, that starling, you can see, shining, beautiful iridescent greens and purples and blues with his little yellow eye. is either a Cape Glossy Starling or a Greater Blue Eared Glossy Starling. And he's just had his morning constitutional. Isn't that nice to see, Vim? Mm-hmm. Yes, very nice. There we go. He waited for us to come past, lifted his tail, did his business, and will fly off to find some insects to eat. That's what they eat. Now, they become almost tame, those starlings, so if you go into a park around the Kruger National Park, you find them everywhere. So, Spara, a nice question in Ontario about the cheetah and what I say that this habitat isn't ideal for them. They can't chase their prey through an area like this, but how, you say, then can wild dogs? They seem to do it very successfully. Well, wild dogs, of course, hunt as a pack, and so they hunt in a different manner. And they do run their prey down in, in a sort of similar way, in so much as they're not stalking predators, they are forcing predators. 
Remember, they hunt in a pack. They don't run anything like the same speed that a cheetah does. A cheetah runs at 60 miles an hour. That's 100 kilometers an hour. Oh, sorry. Quickly, we're going to go across to Jamie. And very well done to Brian, who's spotted probably one of my top five favorite birds of prey and could well be an explanation behind some very skittish guinea fowl that we've been hearing all morning. Uh, this is an African hawk eagle, a specialized bird hunter. And particularly, and I, I've seen a couple of African hawk eagle kills, particularly specializing in guinea fowl hunting and, I, and Franklin hunting. And I'm pretty sure that is why the Franklin was so upset and why they were hiding deep in the thickest part of the bushes that they could find. They were escaping from this particular bird of prey. Quite actually surprisingly uncommon, which is why I'm sort of twisting around looking, it's surprisingly uncommon to see just one of them. Unlike most of the raptors, which although they mate for life, they tend to hunt separately, African hawk eagles hunt as a pair, with one flying higher, one flying lower, utilizing their excellent eyesight in order to hunt down, oh, I think I actually just saw it. I'll keep checking as we move, when we move along. But very, very, very common to see them together in trees. Quite unusual to see one on its own. But that definitely, to me, one of the most attractive of the raptor species. And if you could be so obliging, Mr. or Mrs. Hawk Eagle, if you would very kindly turn around in this beautiful morning light, I would be supremely grateful so that we can show the viewers that barring across your chest. Any luck? No. Oh well, it was worth, definitely worth the effort, but apparently my communication skills don't quite extend to birds of prey. Those speckles of white make for a very, very striking bird. Tiny, in terms of eagle size, one of the smaller ones, and that makes for an incredibly agile raptor. The birds of prey, like the African hawk eagle, just about the same size as a Wahlberg's eagle. And then the smaller goshawks, for example, they're the ones that specialize in the low level sort of flying and hunting, being able to bring their wings in and duck between the branches of trees to catch their prey on the ground. And they weren't nesting originally. There was a pair nesting on Central Road when I first started working here. I don't think they've been that successful. It's been a long time since we've seen them around that area, but it could well be the same pair, or at least this could be part of that same pair. Surveying the area with binocular vision that make raptors such fearsome forces to be reckoned with. Come on, beautiful. Can you give us a turnaround? Oh, is he going to go? There he goes. There you can see the barring on the chest. And Brian, once again, demonstrating how incredibly fortunate we are to have such a talented cameraman. Awesome. Well done, Brian. Right, I'm going to continue on. We've actually got our journey of giraffe a little bit further ahead. So while I try and catch up with them, let's head back across to James because apparently we interrupted him right in the middle of a question. Right, we're back again. Very nice to see that African hawk eagle. Um, I'm surprised that it was on its own. I'm sure, Jamie. Um, we were just nattering about the why it is that we see wild dogs here and how they're able to hunt so successfully around here when cheetah cannot. And I was saying because wild dogs hunt in a pack and so the strategy is different. They are where they wear their prey, prey down by running sort of all sides of them and they don't run anything like the speed of a cheetah. A cheetah runs 60 miles an hour, 100 kilometers per hour which makes it almost completely impossible to, I mean, you can't run at that speed through bush like this. Whereas a wild dog will e easily manage to kind of nip through the bush here. So that's why. 
It isn't actually, while they are both chasing their prey down, the strategy is actually completely different. And it's interesting, you know, you don't have to be the fastest predator in the world here to be successful, but you often have to be the most stealthy. So a leopard, while extremely fast off the mark, I mean, very, you know, show of a short sprint is very good indeed. I mean, it's nowhere near as fast or as full of stamina as a wild dog or a, or a cheetah. And yet they are the most widely spread of all of the cats, stretching all the way from Southern Africa, up through the continent, through the Arabian desert, uh, down through into India and up over the top of the Himalayas and eventually they finish up somewhere around the far east of Russia, down south of Vladivostok. And that's the same species all the way, which I think is just absolutely astonishing. aged 10 in Michigan, you want to know if I, if I ever don't want to get up in the morning, if I ever wake up and think, oh gosh, is it not a little bit early and can't I just go back to sleep? Do you ever feel like that? Every morning. Every morning. Um, <laughs> Alison, I actually don't. I used to. I used to very much. Um, when I was a guide, I used to find it very difficult to get out of the bed in the morning, but that's because we had to sit with our guests at night until they went to bed. And so while they used to just sleep off the middle of the day, we were normally doing bits and pieces. And so I find it very difficult. But now I try and go to bed a bit earlier. And that means that if I have enough sleep, then it's easy to get up. And it's just so worth it, you know. And I never used to believe people when I was your age, Alison. I used to think that people who thought that the dawn or the middle of the morning, you know, the early light was the most ridiculous time to be out of bed. And... is a branch. There's a branch. And when I am up, when I am up, I must just say that it's the most fantastic time of the day to be around. Anyway, let's head across to Jamie. She's got some tall animals, not Brent, something else. I've counted eight giraffe moving through quarantine, which I think for me is a personal record since I started working at Juma. Absolutely lovely to see such a big group of them together. I've seen up to 20, 25 giraffe together before, but not in this particular area. The giraffe here tend to be a little bit more solitary. There's the largest male of the group. Having a look, nope. She obviously did not smell like he wanted her to. Moving off straight away. Two females, fairly young, particularly the one in front is only just past the sub-adult stage. In fact, barely even reaching the adult age. A very special sighting for it. Nice for those of you out there, and I know there's one or two viewers for certain that are absolute giraffe nuts and love them. They are fascinating animals to watch. Also incredibly peaceful. There's a certain grace to the way in which they move. That was a very good question from Sammy watching in Texas. Something I haven't actually thought about. We've often seen snakes in trees around here. You were wondering, what happens if they find one of those? I'm going to reposition as I answer you, now that they've moved a bit further from the road, so they feel a bit more comfortable. Now, I imagine in a giraffe's case, it would rear back and immediately move away from the tree itself. An elephant would also do something similar. They really don't like a small movement, so mice, little birds, anything like that tends to upset them terribly. So I think that the, probably the most likely reaction is to move away. 
I'm just wondering whether giraffe or elephants ever get... Uh, elephants, I think, is fairly unlikely. I think they're far more aware. But I wonder if giraffe ever get bitten on the nose or if there are any recorded cases of that happening. I've never heard of it happening, but that doesn't mean that it isn't the case. Let's just go. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's actually nine in this particular group. Definitely the most I've ever seen, Brian. Yeah. Brian's been here for far longer than I have. Brian thinks it is. One of the largest groups we've seen, or at least for a good period of time. Awesome. That's very special. I wonder if the drought has brought them together or if it's just a sheer coincidence. As I said, they don't have set herd structures. They will happily move about on their own. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, it's definitely nine. They'll happily move about on their own and then come together and then move apart once again. Sorry, just listening to the uh, game drive updates, but it does not apply to us. There are lion tracks on cheetah plains, which will in the future apply to us, but not today, not just yet. So cheetah plains for new viewers, since that would have been very out of context, is one of the other properties in the northern Sabi Sands, and one that at the moment we don't have traverse rights on, but that's being changed. Hello, Zebra. What are you running from? Little jog through the area. And Lauren, I have been looking. Lauren and I'm sure many others would like to know if the baby zebra that was filmed giving birth live by you, Brian. No, no it was Dave. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, it was Dave. Um, with James, it was filmed giving birth on quarantine and Lauren was wondering if we've seen it. And no, we haven't, but I have been looking. I've been checking very carefully around a quarantine area. This looks like one male on his own, from what I can tell. <coughs> oh, excuse me. That took me very much by surprise. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> it took me and the rest of you, I assume, but very much by surprise. Oof, it's the dust. Uh, it's definitely just one stallion on his own. Well, an interesting question that I don't fully know the answer to, but I can sort of guess at, and comes from PK. And PK was wondering if zebras have a different vocal or larynx structure to that of a domestic horse on the basis that they've, he's definitely heard or they've definitely heard zebras making sounds that are outside of the normal range of a domestic horse. And my answer to that is probably yes, to an extent they do. I think every different species has a slightly different vocal cord arrangement. So PK, I would say yes, they would have a different... Oh, is there some courting going on there? Or is it just, I think it's just affection. Nope, it's just a little bit of affection between mom and daughter, I would say. It's two females, a young calf. Not often you get to see giraffe doing that. It's really sweet to witness. I'm most of our giraffe have moved off the road into this block, so we'll settle for this view at the moment. Here we go, she's going to wander out nicely. Look at that colour in the sun. PK, sorry, to finish off your question, every animal has a different, a slightly different arrangement of vocal cords, no matter how closely related they are. So, for example, Leopards make a very different sound to lions, but they're still classed together as one of the panthera family. So the roaring cats. 
and zebra and domestic horses would be something similar. Zebra, of course, make the most phenomenal yip, 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 yip sound. And I'm pretty sure that's the best impression ever, anyone has ever done of a zebra. <laughs> but they do have a very wide vocal range. They are capable of whinnying, though, in a way that's very similar to domestic horses. I've heard them do it once or twice. But for the most part, different species equals a different vocal range. Right, drive along that two track and see if we can get to the other side of those giraffe. Now, I mentioned earlier when I was answering Kathy's question about the naming of the different baby antelope species, I sort of grouped giraffe together with them. And Deborah, who is our armchair, self described armchair traveller, has asked Are giraffe classified as antelope? And they're not but they're grouped very closely related. And the reason behind that, one of the most unifying aspects of it is because they are ruminants, just like antelope. They've got the same hoof structure, so the extended two toes that form each half of a hoof. And that puts them together in the bovids, so more closely to buffalo, but all of those together fall under the ruminants category. So antelope and buffalo and giraffe, which is why I lump them together because they have very similar terminology in terms of naming. So even toed ungulates, as well as ruminants, even toed ungulate, even toes, one, two, two parts of their hooves. Whereas with zebra, they have a completely different naming structure and a completely different digestive system. So they fall in a separate classification under odd-toed ungulates, if you are interested in that particular aspect of them. All right, so I think I'm going to leave our journey of giraffe for now. In the meantime, James has found a monkey to show you. So not a brilliant picture of monkeys, I'm afraid, but that is not the fault of VM. This is the fault of the enormous tree that they have climbed into. Uh, so there's, it looks to be just two of them. And I don't know if you can see that slight blue tinge there in the bottom right-hand side of the monkey you're looking at. That, of course, is why it is called de blow up in Afrikaans. That means the blue ape. And it's called that because of that very bright blue there we go. There you can see it now. Bright blue scrotum that a male vervet monkey has. And they only get that when they're old and be, when they become dominant and then they change to that bright blue color. So it's a sort of sig it signifies the fact that they're fully mature and big and strong as they're going to be. And I mean, I know he doesn't look like much there, but it, Compared with the little female, he's actually quite a large, large monkey. And the sun is, I'm afraid, shining in my eyes as I look up there. Via my car, I can't see him anymore. We are now in the Mlwati drainage line. I have found one Yala which ran away and one Diker which ran away. Thankfully, Jamie is more competent than I am and she has managed to find you some interesting animals as we've gone along. Um, we're going to do a boat ride now down the Mbilagawati. We'll see what we can find there. I'm hoping for some elephants and maybe a male leopard. There's a little bird in here. It's a tawny flanked prinia. I'm just going to see if you can hear it. I might be able to pull it out. It might actually be a green backed Cameroptera. It's in here now. I'll make a sort of an alarm calling sound. Have you got him? There he is. Tawny flanked prinia. Give me a monitor. Brilliant. You're, you're a genius. <laughs> That is a tawny flanked prinia, everybody. We don't get good pictures of them like this. And look, he's standing in amongst the ripening guari berries. That is brilliant. Well done, Viam. Good job. Uh -huh. 
That's so cool. We so seldom see them. We hear them all the time, especially on like a hot summer's day. The tawny flanked pinion. So for those of you who don't have him on your list, I mean, I suspect many of you won't. Add him. Tawny flanked pinion. I don't even need to show you a picture because the picture that VM showed you was too good. Now, Anna-Marie, you want to know when the birds are going to leave here, how soon they're going to start heading north from here. Well, Anna-Marie, it uh, really does depend on the bird, to be honest. Uh, but uh, the swallows are going to leave pretty soon. I think you'll find that um, the red-backed shrike will... Well, they won't go immediately. They'll take a little while still. But I think by the end of the month, a lot of them will start to leave, and by the end of April, everyone will be gone. But they'll come back, they'll come back. 